Hello, everybody, and welcome into my latest live broadcast. It's the 31st of March, the last day of March, 2024. It's Easter Sunday. It's also World Backup Day, and that's what we're here to talk about. You know, uh, World Backup Day should be every day, right? A lot of us, we use our computers every single day, often for hours at a time, day after day, month after month, and year after year. And whatever the heck we're doing on those computers for all that time, uh, likely is something we want to save, something we're assuming is going to be able to be available to us tomorrow so we can continue whatever the heck it is we're doing. Computers are so versatile, it's impossible for me to even guess what you might be doing with your machine. But it's probably important to you. It's not important to me. It's not important to anybody else. But you might be communicating with friends and family, paying bills online. You might have photos that you have scanned in old photos that you don't want to see fading anymore. You could have important uh, medical or legal documents on your machine. You could have personal items of individual passion projects that you yourself have pursued to one day hopefully complete. And many people just assume all of that's going to be there tomorrow for you to pick up where you left off. And for many of us, at some point and at some time, and without any recognizable reason, at least at first, it's gone. Not this, that, or the other. Everything. Everything that you've spent hours every day on your computer doing, whatever that is, it's probably important to you. It's likely not important to anybody else, just you. And I want to emphasize this because when we talk about making backups, we're simply talking about making copies of things that are important to us. If you lose your stuff, it has no impact on me. If I lose my stuff and I'm unable to broadcast, my business gets shut down and I can't help my customers, that has no impact on you. A lot of people think, well, there's nothing on the computer that uh, I could lose that would matter. Okay, just remember you said that when you lose it all because I'm usually the guy who gets the phone call and when you find out how much money it is to do that data recovery, it's something most people can't afford. So you learn to just start over again. I mean, if you're willing to start over again, I mean, you could just go buy a new computer. So and don't worry about transferring anything. There'll be nothing to transfer. It would keep life real easy if you don't want to hold on to stuff and you're not building on anything. So <clears throat> it does seem strange that people can say that this stuff is not important to them and yet spend hours every day without a day off. Every single day. And here we are in Easter Sunday. We're on our computers. But then turn around and tell us uh, it doesn't need to be backed up. Often their attitude changes once they've lost it. It's like, I don't need car insurance. It would be the similar attitude until they get into a car accident. But then it's too late to go and get the car insurance. And that's what happens with data backups. So it gets a little frustrating because this issue of people being ignorant, voluntarily defending their ignorance, by the way, then crying out as victims later is something that's gone on since uh, day one with my experience with computers. It is a human condition of denial and arrogance and obstinance that even in the face of reason and logic, some people simply choose to ignore it because they guess they figure if they ignore it, it's just never going to happen. It's never happened before and therefore it's never going to happen. So we can't, it's hard to get through that mindset for people. And so what I try to do here is remind people of their mortality. You haven't died yet, but you will. Your data hasn't been lost yet. It's going to. Are you ready? That's all I'm asking. Are you ready? So if you're like, hey, if it goes, it goes, I guess you're ready. And I'm not going to hear from you when it goes. You're not going to be asking me for help. You're not going to be crying out as a victim. You knew it was coming. <laughs> and this gets really serious because it has destroyed entire businesses. It has put people out of work. It has put their employees out of work. It has forced customers to have to find other solutions from businesses they used to rely on. And it involves people on a personal level where people have ultimately committed suicide after the loss of some, you know, what is a very traumatic and tragic event 
of data. So if I take this seriously, <clears throat> it's because I see a side of it as a computer technician that most of you at home don't see. And what, what we're trying to do is raise awareness. Like I can't, as much as I would love to, I would love to take care of this for you. I would love to be able to back up your data for you since you figure whatever the excuse is for not doing it, I would prefer to do that than deal with the phone call afterwards where there's nothing I can do. I mean, once it happens, there's no going back. It's pretty much done. But it's so easy to make a data backup and it takes so little time, especially today with modern software and modern hardware, the excuses to not do it are simply, they're ignorance. They no longer play out as a, as a proper, reputable, understandable excuse. So it's hard to feel bad for anybody and they're in their lowest point and then say, I told you so. I mean, that's not helping anybody. So World Backup Day is to remind you and I said, you know, it, it should be every day, but it's there to remind you if your data is important to you, whether or not you think it's, anything's going to happen to it, it, that's not a part of the equation. Nobody asked you. We don't care what your opinion is. We're simply telling you data gets lost every single day. And it always happens to people who don't think it's going to happen or to people who think their data doesn't matter until it's gone and then it matters. And then it's too late. It's too late then to do anything about it. There are data recovery services, but they are not fast and they are very expensive and out of the reach of the affordability of most people. Backups, on the other hand, cost you next to nothing. In fact, you can do a free backup right now. Our friends over at Acronis, that's their specialty. They've been running, uh, the Acronis backup software has been around, well, geez, in my business, I know I've been using it at least since 2009 and probably prior to that. I just know for a fact, I remember the product being called Acronis True Image Echo in 2009. And I'm sure I was using it in 2008, and 2007, 2006, but I, I can't remember exactly when I started. But it's so affordable and it's so easy to use and it makes life so much easier and it removes that anxiety. And if you don't have that anxiety, you should. Because if your stuff's important to you, it, it clearly isn't important to you. I mean, you can't tell me it's important to you and then not back it up. I mean, obviously you don't care. There's no law that says you have to care. There's also no law that says I have to feel any sympathy for you when you called me crying on the phone that you've lost everything. It's a terrible tragedy, but I, I warned and I warned and I warned and I warned and I warned. At some point, I, you know, I get exhausted. So what I choose to do instead is to try and paint that picture in your head and say, look, picture yourself there. Can you handle it? Is that a place you want to be? Because that's a place that you're headed to. I can't tell you when you're going to get there, but you're headed there without a backup. And it's not even enough to have a backup. You've got to have a current backup. It's no good if you made a copy of your data three years ago and you haven't done it since. That means everything you've done every day for the last... 156 weeks or however long it's been is all been lost. And then you're going to say, well, this backup's no good to me. It's too old. It's like a, it's like buying perishable fruit. That's been you've got bananas sitting on the counter for six months. Are you eating those? No, you need to replace those bananas every so often. So I'm trying to help. And sometimes I have to I feel as though in order to get through to people about just how serious this is, is I have to use some extreme real world examples of things that have really happened to real people, and it's not that rare, and ask you if that's a statistic you want to be a part of. Is that a, a, the dice you're willing to roll? You know, the house always wins. You might be on a roll and you might be winning but it's, it's just not going to stay that way. At some point, we've all lost data to the extent of which it varies and whether or not that was a tragic situation or a momentary inconvenience all depends on whether or not you were prepared. So Acronis makes it super easy to be prepared. You don't have to really know anything. You don't even have to know where your data is. It's not expensive. It doesn't take a long time. 
And we have demonstrated walking through the whole process of using Acronis numerous times where you don't even have to know anything but to click on the same things we're clicking on and you'll be done and you'll have it. Then people often try to overcomplicate things by saying, well, now how to run restore it? At which point I say, don't worry about that till you need to restore it. Because what ends up happening is when you make it seem so easy for people, they have to find a reason to justify why they're so intimidated. So they'll find complex questions or ways to make the easy process much more complex to justify why they never did it to begin with. You see, this is why I never got involved in this, because I knew it was more than that. No, 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 no. You just worry about making the backup. When you have a backup, anybody can help you to restore it. That's really no big deal whatsoever. And Acronis allows restores for free, regardless if you have an active subscription or a license, it doesn't matter. Acronis will never hold or withhold your, your uh, critical data from you. You will always be able to restore it. But how? Well, teaching you how to restore your data is very easy compared to teaching you how to live with the trauma and the tragedy of losing everything you've built in the computer digitally, gone forever. If you ask me which of those would I rather be, an educator or a therapist, I'm gonna take an educator because an educator can easily show you how to restore that data in minutes. A therapist you'll likely see for years and may never get over the tragedy and the loss for the rest of your life. When you're on a machine that's such a big part of our lives, every single day of every week of every month for years and years and years you can't tell me there's nothing on here you don't care about i don't believe it but furthermore it has no impact on me right if you lose your stuff and you just didn't realize like you honestly thought there was nothing really on there you'll realize when it's gone that you were wrong that has no impact on me other than you know it adds to my stress when people call when it's too late. So World Backup Day is all about a gentle poke a reminder to say, if you haven't done it in a while, it's a good day to do it. We've had data loss occur to my clients that I service. And in each and every case, we've been able to restore the missing data in minutes. It's such a nothing issue that it, it doesn't even usually get to the boss's attention. The boss doesn't know, hey, the building almost blew up and we shut the gas line off and everything's fine. But that's the equivalent of what we do. We shut the gas line off before the building explodes and real damage is done. By simply having a backup we restore from, we take something that is a potential tragedy that could have a fix that takes, well, how long would it take to if the building blew up, you've got to raise the building, you've got to re-level everything, build it all back up, put all the equipment back in it. Before anybody can get back to work, you're months without work. It is at that level. If a company loses all their client data, they can no longer help their clients. They don't even know who their clients are without that database. So by simply backing it up and restoring it, everything goes right back to how it was as if we could travel through time and go back to yesterday or go back to last week. And we can put it all right back how it was with the click of a mouse, with no trauma, no tragedy. And it's really not a big deal. Isn't that an extreme difference between nothing we can do, everything is gone, to, oh, I have to click a mouse and everything comes back in a few seconds or a couple minutes. Just because we took a few minutes to make a backup and you can automate it. So once you set it up, you don't have to think about it anymore. So that's why I say there's really no good excuse for anybody to be calling me in tears and tragedy and trauma over what was inevitable. It's going to happen to you. If it hasn't happened yet, it will, unless you stop using computers. If you want to go back to a pen and paper, have at it. All right. So the serious nature of this, I cannot underscore enough. And, you know, what's your data worth? Nobody can put a price on your data. There's, if, if you take your computer to a repair shop, it'll say, there's always a sign on the wall, always. Anywhere you go in the world, it says, we are not responsible for any lost data or data that might be lost 
while repairing your computer, in the process of repairing. They can't be responsible for it because how can they replace your photographs of your trip to Maui? They can't. And how do you put a price tag on them? You can't. Therefore, it is irreplaceable. It has no value that we can put a number on. And it is your responsibility at the end of the day to protect your stuff. If you don't want to lock your doors at night or when you leave the house and you want to leave the windows wide open so somebody come in and steal your stuff, that's your choice. You don't have to lock your doors if you don't want to. There's no law that says you have to do it. You don't have to take the keys out of your car. You can leave the keys in your car. I mean, you're inviting it to happen, but it's hard to feel sorry for you when it does. You sort of made it easy for that tragedy to occur. You did nothing to prevent it. And so backups are a very simple, relatively quick way to give yourself some peace of mind, relieve yourself of that anxiety so that you don't become a victim, but instead uh, are minorly inconvenienced at the worst. Oh no, you know, I got ransomware. Oh no, what do I do? Restore your Acronis backup. You'll be back up and running in 10 minutes as though nothing ever happened and you were able to travel back in time. Well, that sounds expensive. Acronis is incredibly cheap. In fact, they're running an even special, more special deal than what we have here year round. If you go to their website right now, their discount, let me bring it up here. Let me just show you. Um, they're practically giving it away at this point. Like, I don't know how much more convincing anybody would need to have, to be honest. You'd have to tell me, do they, do they need to come over and do it for you? They have lowered the price by, hold on, I got to walk up to the screen to read it. The text is too small for my old eyes. Until April 16th, it's up to 50% off, half off. Let me tell you something. Mitch and I ate at Arby's for lunch and it cost me more than that. I didn't get a year of Arby's for that price. I got one meal that satiated me for one day and I was hungry again the next day. So that is a bargain of a bargain. Let me tell you, if your date is not worth $34.99, but you'll pay $600 to $1,200 to recover it from a data recovery service, uh, you and I can't communicate because I don't understand your logic. That is an amazing limited time offer from Acronis, and I hope you guys take advantage of it. Now, there is a try now button you'll see right down there on the left side. <clears throat> That's because they're so confident you're going to like this product. You can download it and use it for free for 30 days, fully functioning for 30 days. And if you don't ever want to use it again, don't buy it. But if you keep the backup you made for free, in two years from now, it's all you have when the data got lost, you can still download the free version of Acronis to restore your data at no additional cost. Sure, you're going to lose everything that you've done since then, but that's a whole lot better than nothing. And the fact that Acronis is so generous and they're so thoughtful when it comes to the consideration of the importance of people's data, even though it has no impact on them, whether or not you've lost your once-in-a-lifetime pictures. You know, the folks, literally anybody is not affected by that but you. So they're doing everything they can to encourage you to make it easy to remove the excuses. And again, for 35 bucks a year, you can set this to automate. So once you've set it up, you don't have to manually do it every time. You can have this run at night while you're sleeping. And again, have peace of mind. Get that, you know, know that everything's going to be okay when tragedy strikes, not if. It's always a question of when. Especially as hackers are becoming more aggressive and more clever, being tricked with AI is going to be more popular than ever. Being able to tell real from fake is going to get more and more difficult. And your data is always going to be important to you and only to you. When the hackers steal or encrypt your data, it has no value to them. They don't care. They don't know what they've encrypted. They just figure if it's on there, it must be important to the person that runs that computer. So we'll encrypt it and tell them they have to give us 500 bucks or a thousand bucks or whatever the amount of money is if they want it back. 
And if we don't get that money in three days, we destroy the key, the data's gone forever. You want to put yourself in that vulnerable position? You have at it. One slip of the mouse click, just not paying attention. You're busy, you're distracted. You got a lot of things going on in your life. You clicked on something you wouldn't have normally clicked on. It only takes once and it happens in seconds and it's done. It's like driving a car. You can be a safe driver your whole life and that one minute you turned your head and didn't pay attention, the car in front of you stopped and you smacked into them. It's a mistake. The question is how expensive is that mistake going to be and how tragic is it going to be? Are there going to be long-term, lifelong consequences or is it just a minor little fender bender? Are you prepared either way? If not, maybe stay out of the car. All I'm saying is, the information I provide here is of a deadly serious nature because in many cases, that's exactly what it can be. And we want to avoid that. We want people to have a great experience with their computer. We want you to have confidence that if things go sideways, you have the time machine that you can go back. I mean, Apple called their backup time machine because you're literally going back in time to before that whatever event happened, drive failure, virus infection, ransomware, accidental deletion, a robbery, a theft, a fire, a flood, some natural disaster that destroyed the building the computer's in, bye-bye data. So uh, when you see all these tragedies on the news every day, you turn on the news, you see another tragedy, rarely do they discover, uh, dis discuss rather the data loss. That's rarely if ever talked about. But if you actually talk to the people yourselves rather than the news reporter with the microphone going, hey, blah, 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 how's it? Right? And their house is flooded with water this high up, and they're like, we've lost everything. We've lost our furniture. We've lost, you know. But then when they really sit down and think about, you know, they've had time to process and they realize our computers no longer work. Uh, everything's ruined, it's all gone forever. So when we make backups, it's important we keep the backups in another building or we put our backups up in the internet or what we call the cloud. And Acronis does all of this. It leaves it up to you to decide. Do you wanna do a backup this way? Do you wanna do a backup that way? Do you wanna do every backup possible? It's not like they're charging you for each backup. Once you own the software, you can use it every minute of every day and it doesn't cost you any more money. That's the beauty of it. So I've got a couple of machines here, right? These are the giveaways. By the way, we still have a couple of these giveaways to go out to people in need. And these are refurbished off-lease Windows 10 computers that they're actually quite fast, but they are not Windows 11 compatible. Windows 10 still has a year and a half of life still left in it. So these are really good machines. And then we have things like portable SSDs, relatively inexpensive portable hard drives that run off USB. You could even, depending on the amount of data you have, move it to a flash drive. You could put it up in the cloud somewhere. If you have Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, Dropbox. Um, Acronis themselves offers cloud storage that ties right in with their software. So it's all seamless and integrated. So you don't have to be a computer genius to figure out how to get the data where you want it when it's an untraditional or unusual location. But um, we have done several interviews with the folks at uh, Cronus, specifically Begout, and who has walked us through every step. And so if you're unfamiliar with the proce process, if it's intimidating to you, download the free software, watch our interview, which I'll put a link to in the video notes, and you don't have to know anything. Just click on the same things we click on, and you'll end up with a backup at the end of it, and then put that backup away. If you've got to keep it in the same building and you don't have any choice, put it in a safe, some kind of a fireproof safe is the least you can do. But do bear in mind when people are robbed, safes are usually the first thing the robbers try to steal. Just know that you can encrypt your backup so that if somebody were to steal it, they wouldn't be able to make heads or tails of it without knowing the password. Essentially, if you forget the password, you won't be able to access your backup either. Sort of like locking the doors and forgetting your keys, you will lock yourself out. So a lot of things to consider here, depending on the nature of your data, how much of it you have and how important it is to you. Okay, World Backup Day. It's an important day. 
and it should be every day, but it affects nobody but you. It has no impact on anybody else. So if you choose to ignore it, or if you choose to think it's nonsense, have at it. Believe whatever you want. You can believe that outside it's nighttime when clearly I can see it's the afternoon. You can tell me it's sunny outside when I can clearly see here it's raining. It doesn't change anything. You know, what you believe doesn't change reality. But you are the one, and only you, will deal with the consequences if you choose uh, to see things uh, in a certain perspective that don't align with reality. That, that's your choice. And it's very, very difficult to help people who somehow believe if they just think a certain way that certain things won't happen. I wish that were true because I would be a multimillionaire right now. And this would be one of my several homes. I keep thinking it, but it just hasn't manifested. So, you know, maybe these other people know something I don't. But um, what I can tell you that does work is making backups. And it has saved my business. Imagine you're a company that's paid me to maintain your computers and something, I don't know, server drive goes down. And all the data is on the server drive. It's gone. Who are you going to call? You call your computer guy. Computer guy says, oh, sorry, we don't have any backups. You can best believe I'm going to find myself in a courtroom with no proper defense and out of business and likely with a judgment against me for the value of how much money that business has lost and what it's going to cost to repair far greater than any amount of money I'll ever make in my life, leading to a bankruptcy and it's a whole downward spiral. At the same time, imagine how it's a non-issue for my customers when they call me and they say, hey, the server drive died. I go, no problem. I go over there, I swap the drive, the data rebuilds, they're back up and running in a couple hours. It's a minor inconvenience and they may not like that, but at the same time, it's easily forgotten because once they're back to work, nobody thinks about it anymore. It's all forgotten about. The minute things are put back and everything's back up and running, it's all let go. But when things can't be put back or when there is difficulty in putting things back, which is resulting in the business being down longer, it's not soon forgotten. And they will live with that every day and probably hold it against you to the point of deciding to go a different direction with their support to find somebody else because they're still suffering the pain and scarring from how painful it was to get them back up and running and may still be trying to recover the lost business where customers decided they weren't going to wait anymore and they took their business somewhere else and never came back again. That's a pretty, pretty serious issue versus grandma lost the photos of the grandbaby. But to grandma, that's the whole world. And to lose those is losing everything. It's kind of the same thing if you're the one that's affected by it. But when it's somebody else, it's like, yeah, well, they should have known. That's the whole tragedy of the whole thing. All right, let's say hello to everybody in the chat room. It's a pleasant discussion, isn't it? I really want you to be able to have the self-confidence and, and the peace of mind knowing that you will never be a victim of this because you made your backups. How you, usually, how you make the backups, that's entirely up to you. I'm here to offer a Cronus at a steep discount just as one of many solutions, as long as you've done something that you can rely on, we don't want you to be a victim. We're just looking out for you, man. Rick Lakes with a $5 super chat. Thank you, Rick. Mark Baggett renews membership, now a member for 22 months, says happy Easter. Right on, thank you. Davis Parsons with 10 bucks says, I've used Acronis for years, it is worth the money. My K drive is an eight terabyte drive for all my backups. By the way, backup drives fail too. Sometimes your main drive is fine. The drive you're backing up in case it fails isn't the drive that fails, it's the backup drive that fails. That's why it's important you have at least two backup drives. Preferably three, but at least two. Billy Herring with a $10 super chat. Thank you, Billy. Scott mentions that restoring the computer is way faster than the time it takes just to reinstall Windows. 
by far. It's at least 95% faster, minimal, um, to, to restore rather than to rebuild. Larry G, Renews membership, also a member now for 22 months. Right on. Thank you, Larry. Mark Kenny says, I have a Cronus. I love it. It's so easy to do a backup. Thanks, Kerry. I've had this software for four or five months now, and I use an SSD drive for the backup, and it works great. Again, I hope you use more than one backup drive. Larry G with a $20 super chat says, hello to chat. Hello, Carrie, for all you do. Hey, Larry, thank you for your contribution. Arnold wants to know if using Cronus, I can back up with an installed copy and restore from an image USB. Yes, you can. That's what the Acronis Rescue Disk is for. Stephen Bell said he uses Hard Disk Sentinel Pro to check my drives and make sure they're running well. If a drive gets any health problems, I replace it. Unfortunately, that's one of about 12,000 ways you can lose your data. Drive failure is probably the most common way people lose their data. However, data loss occurs from, if I started naming all the ways data loss occurs from data corruption and viruses and ransomware to accidental deletions, I mean, we could be here for the next two hours as I just go through the list of all the reasons people lose data where the drive is running just fine. Fires and thefts and floods. The only thing I can tell you universal about data loss is anybody that's ever experienced it, the one thing they all have in common is none of them were expecting it. Simply monitoring your drive health has nothing to do with being robbed, being infected, it has nothing to do with a natural disaster. It has nothing to do with a fire. It has nothing to do with data corruption that can occur. It has nothing to do with, uh, you know, you installed a piece of software that just went sideways and now the computer doesn't work anymore. When all of the hardware's fine, but the person, the human being screwed it up. So monitoring drive health in and of, of itself it's sort of like, well, I go to the doctor every year and I get a physical. That doesn't mean that you're not going to die in a natural disaster or a car accident or some other tragedy that you otherwise were perfectly healthy had nothing to do with your health. You were just at the wrong place at the wrong time. So simply monitoring drive health is, is a very, very tunnel visioned way of looking at it. It is a small piece of what can alert you to what's coming, but only in that particular circumstance. It ignores all of the other circumstances that you don't get any warning on. And also, sometimes drives just fail without warning. So you can run a health status today, says your drive is healthy, and go to use the drive tomorrow and the drive is dead, just completely dead without warning. Just because you can monitor the health status, you're putting a lot of faith and a lot of trust in the information you're getting back being truthful. Again, with AI and the way the internet even is today, to believe anything that you see without proper verification through independent tools in your own investigation, I think is highly, highly irresponsible. Who's to say how accurate the health software is? Who's to say that it's doing anything at all but giving you the information you want to see? How do you know what you are getting from this piece of software, whether it's a benchmark or uh, you know something that's determined, is actually not making things worse? How do you know that the act of actually running that software is causing wear and tear on the drive, which will ultimately cause it to fail earlier? All of this is possible. There are people that want to monitor their computer resources, but in doing so, they need to use more resources to run the monitoring software to monitor the resources, leaving less resources for the things that they're apparently concerned about resources being used for. That's the irony in all of this. People are often short-sighted when they do things like un they install uninstall software because they think the uninstall software is more thorough than using the regular Windows uninstall. And while that may at times be necessary on very rare occasions for poorly programmed or installed software, you are installing a piece of software whose purpose is to uninstall software. So if your goal was to clean up the computer by taking software you didn't want off of it, 
Putting a piece of software on to do that is the opposite of achieving your goal. This is the end user. These are the decisions we see in the industry that we have to go and explain to the user, this uninstall software should not be something that is left on the computer and never should have been put on unless you had a problem. And once that problem was resolved, it should have been removed since that was the whole reason you put it on there to begin with was to remove other software. There is a weird mentality that people just can't seem, a lot of people can't seem to see past the front door. They're opening a front door and they're walking off a cliff. And you're like, what? did you see where the front door was leading before you took that step? Well, it's a door, it's gotta go somewhere, right? That's, that's better than here. And then right off the cliff they go because they weren't paying attention and they weren't thinking of the long-term consequences of what could possibly be on the other side. And it could be a lot worse. So there are consequences to actions. Not everything we do is going to benefit us simply because we've installed a piece of software that is, when, when you have a data backup, you have peace of mind knowing that you're essentially bulletproof now. Anything that you can imagine and anything you can't imagine is now completely recoverable with your data backup by restoring it. And you have armor that you didn't have. Your backup is your armor. And that armor will literally stop any threat. Threats you can conceive of and threats you've never even conceived of. Things you saw coming, things you never saw coming. The armor is a choice to wear it. If you want to be vulnerable and go out without the armor, it's a rough place out there on the internet with very few consequences to the bad actors. And life can be harsh at times when, you know, tragic things happen. When the drunk driver drives through the house, you see it on the news all the time. I hope it's never happened to you. What if that drunk driver drove into the room that the computer's located in? Your data's gone. It's gone. Never mind the tragedy that now your house is wide open and open to the weather and you've got to get a construction crew and probably have to move out because it's unsafe and go live in a hotel. And the whole structure has to be analyzed by city code to make sure it hasn't, you know, affected the foundation of the house. But here in Phoenix, we see that on the news almost daily. Now, it's unlikely, but it happens. And it's happening to somebody who it never happened to before. It's not like somebody lives in a house that constantly gets cars running into it. Maybe there's somebody out there. It's a pretty unusual thing to happen. It rarely, like lightning, it very rarely strikes at the same place twice. Your backup is your armor. It's the best way I can put it. And the armor is very inexpensive and it's very comfortable. All right, let's see what else we got in here in the chat. Howdy, howdy. Ow, I just banged my fingers against the table. Howdy, howdy with a $10 super chat. Thank you, howdy, howdy. Nick Caffrey with five euros said, here's for coffee, tea, or whatever for Marlena. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you, Nick. Nick Caffrey says he bought a Cronus back in January. He backs up his documents, his pictures, and his music to an external disk, and he backs up the entire system to external disk. Then he only connects to the computer once a month. That's as important. Leave your backup drive disconnected, because if your computer gets infected, the infection will infect all connected drives. So you only plug in your drive when you need it. When you're not using it, unplug it. That'll also extend the life of the drive. These don't have any cooling fans in them. There are no cooling fans in here. This is not meant to be an outboard storage. This is meant to be connected, used, and disconnected, both for the longevity of the device, as well as for the safety and security of protecting it from anything that could cause. Look, if this is attached and there's a fire, a theft, a flood, the thief's just gonna take it all, right? If this is moved somewhere else, in particular a safe or a different building, if there's a virus that's spreading over the network, but this isn't connected, this is clean. This is totally inoculated in its own little bubble. So absolutely great process there. And that's why you do it that way. <clears throat> now, when it comes to failed hard drives, as I've mentioned, when it came to data recovery, certainly, you know, I've been in this business over 30 years. 
And most data recovery occurred due to an unexpected hard drive failure. But that's becoming less and less common. Solid state drives have proven to be very robust. And the last time I've replaced a failed hard drive, I mean, I've seen some that come in from old computers that people are, you know, donating. But as for like a computer that's in production that somebody's using in their house or in their workplace that has a failed drive, in most cases, if I ever see that, those drives are well over a decade old. It's pretty rare that I run into a failed drive that isn't 10 plus years old. You know, a drive that should have been replaced a long, long time ago and people were just being fools to continue to use it. And then on top of that, not back it up. So the age of your equipment also is a variable worth considering with regards to the likelihood of when this is going to affect you. Not if, it's going to affect us all eventually. Some people it's going to affect multiple times and some of us maybe just once and we take steps to make sure it won't happen again. And for others, they invite it because they use old equipment. They claim they can't afford anything newer, but then also claim the data they've got on it is absolutely priceless. Those two things don't add up. So if you have an, um, an older computer or the storage that you're using is 10 or more years old, you should seriously consider replacing the drive. And if for any excuse you will not do that, I hope you don't really care too much about the data. If you do care about the data, I hope you can come up with a few dollars to use a program like Acronis to make a copy. And that probably is going to take a bit longer because the old drive is going to be quite a bit slower. But that's often where tragedy occurs, is people using old obsolete equipment that should have been retired, and it just died. It just it lived a full life. It was being used every day, day after day, week after week, year after year. After 10 years, I don't know how long you think a mechanical drive is going to last you. But in a world that evolves as quickly as technology does, it's an awfully foolish move, in my opinion, as a technician to rely on old obsolete technology for things that are priceless to you, things that are critical to your business or things that are going to result in having some mental challenges to overcome that could have been avoided for a few dollars, but instead are now going to cost a lot more and take a lot more time if it's even possible to revive it. These are the tragedies. So data loss regarding failed drives today in 2024, I would say 80% of the failed drives that I will see are coming from drives that are obsolete drives and should have been retired years earlier. And some people just, you know, these people, they will take something until it doesn't work anymore. Well, if you have a backup and your drive doesn't work anymore, you'll be okay. You just have to buy a new drive and restore your backup. But if you have no backup, but you refuse to replace your drive until it fails, it'll be too late. At that point, you've lost everything and you did it to yourself. Again, it's, it's, it's like, what? I tried to help you, you know? I, I tried to warn you. And you if you choose to, to, to take that risk in life, it's not a question of if it's going to happen. It's just a question of when. And I don't know when, but when it happens, I know you're not going to like it. And you're not going to like the results. So the, I just can't see any downside to making a backup. The best thing possible is you spent a little bit of money to have a peace of mind. And I don't know how much is peace of mind worth to you. I've been up and down Walmart every aisle and I can't find it available for sale. I've been down the sporting goods section. I've been down the grocery section. Nowhere do I see peace of mind or happiness available for sale at any price. Think about it. Bikeman with a $13, well, that's a very specific country, $13 super chat says, I just finished my backups earlier. I got to look into the safe for the drive soon and clean out my closet a bit more. 
the store said safe. Yeah. Well, remember, when thieves break in, they're going to go for a safe. They assume anything of value will be in the safe. So safes are okay, especially if they're bolted to the ground where they can't be removed. But it is also a way of advertising something of value is in here to a thief. On the other hand, if there's a fire, something like that, a safe can protect what's in it. So off-site backups are always best. And of course, if you forget the combination or the key to the safe, you've just prevented yourself, you've locked yourself out. So just all things to keep in mind. It's not a, not a simple solution such as an encrypted off-site backup, which is a simple solution that is immune to all of those types of attacks and losses. So at the end of the day, it depends how much time and effort you want to put into it. But having something is a lot better than having nothing. And hopefully you never need it. John Casey said, the last time I recall a lot of failed drives was when Seagate had issues around 2012. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. Mark Kinney said he's got an SSD USB. And after backup, it's unplugged. Absolutely, that's, that's the way you do it. Scott said, if you have multiple PCs, at least keep a copy of pictures and important documents on more than one computer. That won't help you if, say, for example, your power company through an electrical storm, it's a heavy rainstorm or a tornado or some weather event, causes a power spike that kills all the electronics in the house. So again, it's better than nothing. But as long as that computer's in the same building and susceptible to the same events, including viruses, thefts, fires, floods, you just have the same exact thing happening twice now. You need to make a copy of it and you need to get that copy disconnected away from the network and if possible, away from the building. That way, regardless of robberies, regardless of weather events, uh, you're protected. And again, uh, Cronus has that all built in. If you wanted to use their uh, online storage, it's available. It, it, you get a limited amount of storage. And if you need more than that, they charge more for it. Because obviously, if you have more stuff, you might have to rent a storage shed to put your stuff in. If you have more stuff, it costs more to store it. That's just the way life is. If you have three cars, but a two-car garage, you might have to buy some kind of structure if you want to keep the other car out of the weather whether that means expanding the garage or putting up a temporary tent or something that you can park the car to keep it away from the sun or the weather or the pigeons. You understand what I'm saying? But you wouldn't have that problem if you didn't have the third car. If you're somebody that's a data hoarder, it can cost a lot of money to back that data up regardless, and it can take a lot of time. So if you are a data hoarder, then it's time for you to say, okay, what's the stuff I can live without? Because this is way too expensive to keep it. I know people that steal movies and music and they want to back them up and God forbid they should lose all the stuff they stole. They'll spend more money, literally, backing up all of the stolen media that would, it would have cost them to simply rent it from Netflix or Spotify and then not have any of the expense or worry of trying to protect. I've spent hours stealing this data. You have any idea how much research and time I have spent Finding all of these stolen movies and music, I don't want to lose that. Sometimes my job is difficult. Kenneth Brown said, I have my data on Google Drive, however, once a month, I download my data to a flash drive, and I leave that at work because Google Drive does not mean that Google won't have a problem. Well, no, but the idea that you would have a problem at the same time Google Drive would have a problem seems, seems like that's an event <laughs> where there's bigger, higher powers at play that are against you. However, um, nothing wrong with overkill when it comes to backups. The problem is when people won't do it at all. So... We're, we're trying to encourage people to find a means to back it up. Like I said, Acronis is one solution. There's many other ways. 
which are literally better than no way at all. And when you hear somebody who just goes over the top with their backups, nothing wrong with that at all. If you have the time and the means and the motivation to make multiple copies in multiple places because your data is that important to you, that benefits you. And, you know, especially if it's not costing you anything but a, a few moments of your time, it's a worthy investment. Jason H88, who's been a member now for 22 months, so Acronis is a wonderful tool. One thing I like is it just works, as does all of the software and hardware you recommend. Thank you, Uncle Kerry, for all of your teachings and sharing of your knowledge. Well, right on. I mean, look, I run a business, and I'm trying to show you the inside of how the business runs. If these are the services that customers are paying me for, and I'm showing you how to do it yourself, and this is services that I provide at a fee that have kept me in business over 30 years, there must be something to that, right? So I could be a cook and then I could be somebody who never shows you how the meals are made so that you could never feed yourself. If you want to eat what I'm cooking, then you have to come to me and pay my price. Instead, I'm saying, here's the meals that I sell the most of that haven't poisoned or hurt anybody because I've been in business for over 30 years. People keep coming back and eating again. Let me show you how I make it so you don't have to pay my price or rely on me. You just have to be willing and motivated to do it yourself. And that's the hardest part. So many people won't get off their butt and do it. And I think that's great. Hire me. If you don't want to do it, if you can't be bothered, hire somebody to do it for you. If you've got that kind of money where you can afford to hire somebody to do it, I've made a career out of that. But if you're like most of us and you don't have that much money, you can do it yourself, save a ton of money, and be empowered, and hopefully be able to spread the message to your friends and your family who are also of the same school because you probably learned it from influences in your life, and now you can lead the way for them and say, look, this is really important. Let me show you how easy it is. And we can change the world, right? Or we can just re you know, let it be somebody else's problem, and I'm happy to earn a career from other people who can't be bothered to... to Pay me to do it for them. I mean, I'm fine with it. There's some things I don't want to do myself. I don't want to do my own dental work. I don't want to do my own surgeries. But if there's something that is relatively simple and inexpensive, I'd hate to pay somebody to do something. But my, my pool guy wanted $75 to change a little part on my uh, pool vacuum. He goes, this part is torn. I've got a spare one in the truck. It's $75. I said, I can get those parts two for $10 on Amazon. I'll show you. He goes, yeah, but mine are name brand parts. I don't deal with the junk Amazon sells. I go, here's the problem. Your name brand part already failed. It's not even been a year. It's already failed. If I had to replace this part at $5 a part, Every 30 days after a year, it still wouldn't add up to $75. And this part didn't last a year. So you can't tell me that name brand parts are better when the evidence shows they're not. So I said, thank you for bringing it to my attention. I'll take care of it myself. And by the way, there's over 3,000 reviews on Amazon suggesting and implying and claiming that this $5 part lasts twice as long as the OEM part at less than 90% of the cost. You might want to consider offering that choice to your customers because I'd pay you to install it, but I'm not going to pay you $75 for a $5 part that I can easily do myself. There are YouTube videos that show the, 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 the thing just unscrews, the, pop, the piece pops off, you pop the new piece on, you screw the piece on, it's done. You don't need an education or a college degree it's just whether or not I want to be bothered, right? So if I want the pool guy to do it. I'll pay a reasonable amount of money for that, but I should know what a reasonable amount of money is. He's counting on the fact that I don't know, but I'm just going to go, yeah, just take care of it, whatever. I don't have that kind of money. I can't say, yeah, I mean, I'd like to. Do you think I want to go out there and do that? I don't. I'd rather not. But would I rather have $70 versus $75 being spent, right? 
two for $10. So I've got a spare in case this one breaks again. So what? It's a three minute fix that costs $5. No wonder why he wants $75. What an easy way to make money. He's already getting paid for the pull service and now he's finding a way to nickel and dime me for a bunch of other stuff. And I'm not saying he caused the problem, but he certainly wasn't helpful in encouraging it to be fixed by having it so outrageously priced and refusing to accept that the name brand was as good as or less than the knockoff that Amazon sells. Despite all the reviews, he won't see it. He's obstinate. It's just, I'm not going to stand behind a cheap product. Well, you didn't stand behind the name brand one. I don't see you replacing it under warranty. You're not reassuring me it comes with a warranty. So apparently, even when the name brand product fails at $75, I'm still paying you another $75 to replace. What sense does that make? I mean, I understand the sense it makes from his perspective, but where does that make sense on my perspective? I'll do it myself. That way I'll make sure it gets done right. And that's how you should feel about your backups. You can pay somebody like me to do it for you. It's expensive because there's a lot of liability, legal liability that's put on me or anybody who does that kind of work. It also is very time consuming. You can do this yourself for effectively nothing. Even using the free trial of Amazon for 30 days is completely free. It just takes your time. That's it. That's all it is. It's a few minutes of your time. If you don't have the time, hire somebody. If you don't have the time and you don't have the money, maybe don't use a computer. Probably not a good idea. Maybe just uh, get yourself a phone or a tablet and be done with it. I'm just saying. Otherwise, you're just setting yourself up for big expenses. And if you can't afford those big expenses, why are you setting yourself up for them? So there are steps, as I mentioned, that are effectively like insurance or armor. And programs like Acronis are easy. They're not complex. They're very affordable. I don't care. Anybody who says they can't afford it is a liar. That's, there's nobody in the world who can't come up with $35. There's no one in the United States, not in the world. Being an American, I often think, you know, the whole world is America. <laughs> there's nobody in America that has a computer and is paying for internet service who can't afford $35. I just don't believe it. And I mean, they seem to find money for alcohol and cigarettes, but not necessarily for things that actually matter. So I have a very hard time finding any sympathy to hear that story. They just don't want it bad enough. The things that they really want, they somehow find the money for that. So when they want their data back and they find out it's going to cost $600, they, they either find a way to come up with $600 or they're in a very bad mood for a long time. So can you blame me for trying? You know what I mean? Like, I'm just trying. That's all I'm doing. I don't know how effective I'm being. It's maddening. Uh, thank you to Frankie B. A very generous Amazon gift card came in just before the show today. And Frankie's been a wonderful supporter as Peter Laycock, Buster, and Oystein, and several others with whom, without whom much of our content wouldn't be possible. And of course, a super shout out and thanks to our friends at Acronis, where they're offering you guys this discount that I use in my business and have been using it in my business for over a decade. Probably good enough for home use if I can run a business off of it. I'm just saying. But the only way you're going to know that is to have your own experience. And it's very affordable. It's very easy to use. And as I mentioned, we have tutorials that walk you through the whole process so you don't need to know anything. Just monkey see, monkey do. You see us click, you click. You see us do that, you do the same thing. You don't have to learn a thing if you don't want to. Just click on the same things we click on and you'll get the same end result of a backup, and it'll cost you nothing. I don't know. Is there anything else I can do? Did anybody think of any other way that I can convince people not to injure themselves? Because I don't know what else to do. <laughs> Victor says, Happy Easter, and hello to Carrie, Marlena, and chat. Welcome in, Victor. Good to see you.
So, does anybody here not back up their data? And if so, why? UFO man says, be the butcher, not the butchered. I like that. I've never heard that expression before, but it certainly seems to fit. Zach says, I like to live on the edge. I think anybody on the edge likes to live on it. It's the people who die off the edge that have the problem. But they never come back again to tell you about it. Once you're off of the edge, you're gone forever. And you're now a part of history. And whether or not anybody even isn't aware of it, it's really only something that affects you. So enjoy the edge, my friend. It was nice knowing you. See, the problem with the edge is when you fall off. And the longer you stay on it, the more likely you're going to be to fall off of it. And whether or not you survive that fall, well, it's your free will. Joe Justice says he backed up his data Friday. There you go. Gil Garcia says, I don't keep my data here on site with me. Right on. Nick Caffrey says, do you make a differential or incremental backup? Really, I don't do either one. I do full backups only. I find there to be a bit of confusion, personally, with incremental versus differential. Now, Acronis will do any of the three. You can do full backup, incremental, or differential. And for me personally, I don't like the confusion, especially when you do as many backups as I do. Um, I let the backup run at night, and it doesn't matter. So the idea is that it's faster to do just differential or incremental backups. After you get your main backup, then you're just backing up what's changed. Either what's changed since the last change or what's changed since the main backup, right? That's the, infra that's the difference. And I don't wanna deal with that. I want one main backup and I wanna have several of them. So I wanna rotate them. If we're talking about just data, if I don't care about the operating system and the installed programs, cause all that can be put back. Let's say we got a, an office with 50 computers. I'm not backing up 50 computers. You're out of your mind. On a regular basis, that would be a full-time job that would not enable me any time to do anything. And the company would spend more money on those backups than the cost to simply rebuild or even replace the computers. So it's not financially feasible. Instead, the, the employees are all trained to put their data onto a network attached storage device or a server. And then just the data itself is file synchronized to an external drive, which is taken off site or put out somewhere into the cloud where it's secured. So file synchronization is another possible um, backup solution, depending on what your end goal is. For most people watching YouTube videos, they're going to be at home watching on a computer and you want a full image backup. You don't have 20 other computers to go to if you're like most people. Backing up all 20 computers would be very time consuming and very costly. So for most people using a full image backup is the way to go. And that's what I do. I do full image backups. They're automated to run at night and the drives get swapped out. So a drive does stay plugged in for upwards of a week. And then it's unplugged and replaced with a different drive and the drives are swapped out. So if the drive should fail because it was plugged in, I still have other backups with other drives and the drives are rotated around and I don't have to think about it. Just leave it plugged in every Monday, unplug it, change it for another one. And the software on a scheduler runs while I'm sleeping and it's out of sight, out of mind. I just verify before I pull the drive, the backup ran. It did. I see the date on it. Unplug it, plug the next one in and I rotate between six drives. So I have six weeks. I can go back six entire weeks. So if I realize I deleted something three weeks ago and I've only just now realized it, I can go back to the data backup from three or four or five or six weeks ago and that data is still there. If you want to keep your data indefinitely and then you want to do versioning, again, that's going to take up more space, more time, and it will ultimately cost you more money. But, you know, it depends how many versions you want to be able to go back to. So for me, it's just about having the latest version. That's my main focus. 
Make me, let me make sure I have the latest version and let me make sure I back up to multiple drives. And by the very process of changing the drives, I'm keeping multiple versions. You understand what I'm saying? And that's a process that works really well for me because once I've programmed it, once I've scheduled it, I hate to use the word program because it sounds complicated. Once I've just automated the process, which is very simple to do with the Cronus, then the only part I have to remember is to switch the drive out. Now, if I wanted to put it all online, I wouldn't even have to do that, right? It would just be automated and I just leave the computer on at night and it would take care of it for me. So there's lots of different ways that you can accommodate your backup to, to um, trying to find the word, but essentially to confirm or conform to whatever your needs, priorities, or desires are. It doesn't say you have to do it my way. It says, what way do you want to do it? And, and Acronis will work around whatever your limitations or desires are. It conforms to you and your needs. And since very rarely do two people have the same needs, the software being able to do that while at the same time not being complicated is a heck of an achievement. Because one of the things that makes software complicated is adding too many options, too many bells, and too many whistles. You walk into an airplane cockpit, and what do you see? Buttons, dials, lights, switches. It's just a ceiling and wall filled overwhelmingly with bells, whistles, and dials. And maybe all you're looking for is the clock or a way to switch on or off the lights to turn the lights on or off. You're looking for one switch and they all look alike and it's overwhelming and you're like, oh, I'm out. Never mind, I'll get a flashlight. The fact that a Cronus can be like that airline cockpit with so many bells, whistles, and features, and yet the way they've uh, set up the interface is it just kind of based on the first decision you make, then offers you the next decisions. So you're not overwhelmed with all the decisions at once. Some decisions automatically are no longer applicable based on the first decision. And that's so logical and it's so easy you can make your backup as simple or as complex as you as an individual choose to make it to conform to your specific needs, desires, or wishes. 35 bucks. Come on. That's pretty impressive. Nothing makes software worse than trying to conform to every single user's needs because it makes it too complex for the average user. It's overwhelming. There's too many options. The way Acronis has dealt with this, they've simplified it. And it's the way all software should be, as far as I'm concerned. Give the advanced users the options, if they want those options, but don't overwhelm the standard user who just wants the basics. That should be a rule for all software, as far as I'm concerned. Martin Hogg says, hello. There's Chris Dune, or Dunn, with a $1.99 in Super Chat. Thank you, Chris. What's the difference between an image and a clone? That's what Mustang Mike wants to know. Cloning is when we want to take a drive and copy all the data off of the drive onto another drive, typically to replace the drive with a newer, faster, larger drive. We typically clone it. An image takes all the data on the drive and compacts it into a file to put onto a storage device so that we could image multiple computers all on the same storage device, provided I have enough space to hold all the images. So images are like backups and cloning is like um, moving the data to another drive and it's and not changing the data. Imaging changes the data and in, it puts it into, it takes all the data and puts it into one big file. Think of it like a zip file or an archive. And then you need a special piece of software. Typically the software that made the image is the only software that can make sense of the image. Just like trying to open a zip file, you need a program that can open zip files. You can't just open that notepad. You can't make heads or tails out of it. It's all shrunk down. They took a bunch of files and packaged them all up into one file. Think of it like if you ordered some, I don't know, you ordered something from Amazon. You've ordered some silverware. You've ordered an eight piece, an eight piece set of silverware. So you get eight forks, eight regular forks, eight salads, 
uh, sell it for you. Eight knives, you get eight large spoons, eight small spoons, right? Service for eight. Would it make sense for them to put each spoon in its own package, another spoon, and then mail you 48 different packages, each one containing one utensil? Or would it make more sense to put all the utensils together, put it in one box, and when you get the box, you open it up and you take all the utensils out yourself? That's essentially what an image or a zip file. So an image is taking all of the data on the drive and compressing it down into one file. And that way you can put multiple images of multiple computers onto whatever capacity drive you want to put it on. A clone literally takes only the data and moves it to another drive in exactly the same form. And you can only move the clone one. You, you could, the destination of the clone can only hold the clone in nothing but the clone. Typically, when you want to replace a drive, people usually replace the drive and clone the drive because they want one that's larger capacity, faster. And they don't want to reinstall everything. So we clone it. It's a mirror. We take a mirror copy and put everything over that was here and we mirror it over here. But there's no room for anything else when we do that. You understand? Like, you can't clone two different clones on one drive. One drive, one clone. But you can store several images on one drive, up to the capacity of the drive. Could be a thousand images. Depends on how big the backups are and how big the, uh, the drive is. So think of cloning in terms of hard drive replacement. That's it. <clears throat> I appreciate the question. Jerry wants to know here in the chat room, what's a solution to backing up large drives like eight terabyte? I use large drives for my media server. Well, the best way to back up a large drive is to back it up to another large drive. So when we have these uh, like uh, network attached storage devices that could be 40 terabytes, 80 terabytes, they usually have a utility built into them that can automatically talk to another unit, like from one Synology to another Synology, that you can program them or schedule them to say, take all the data off the main Synology and copy it to the remote Synology. And the Synologies are typically the same make and model with the same drives and storage capacities, where one is simply a backup and it exists offsite, typically somewhere else. And the internet is used at night when nobody's using it to put all the data that's changed from the one Synology to the other. If you have 12 terabytes of data, you will need a backup of 12 terabytes or larger of capacity. If you have 40 terabytes or larger, you will need a 40 terabyte or larger drive to back it up. You cannot put 10 pounds of crap in a five pound bag. Pretty straightforward, I think. But I appreciate the question. The good news is they do sell external drives now up to 24 terabytes so you could still use an external drive if you want to but i would recommend you have at least two of them minimum now if you have uh any confusion about backups we're making copies. That's all we're doing. We're just making copies of things that are important. Please ask. This is why we do these videos live. David Southern says, hello from Portugal. Right on. Well, welcome in. My family on my mother's side is Portuguese. So there you go. Brothers from other mothers, perhaps. Yang wants to know, do I think AOMI backup or free edition is good? I don't think anything free should be taken seriously. If you want to, if your data is so worthless to you that you can't be bothered to buy a product that you can get support on, but you would rather just use something for free. Have you ever gotten anything in your life you can count on for free? 
Can you name one example of something critical in your life that you got for free that did not potentially have consequences or you had no recourse? So for example, Gmail is free. And if you use the free version of Gmail and you have any problems, there is nobody for you to talk to. If the service goes down or if your email gets erased through a mistake, Google owes you nothing. There's no accountability and no responsibility. Do you want to take something that you consider to be precious and priceless and trust it to some free piece of software that has no guarantee, no warranty, and no support? That's your choice. But it seems to me it's not that important to you. So anything that's free comes at a cost. You may not realize that cost for a while, but it'll cost you a lot more than free. I, I'm not aware of any exception to that. Edward says Linux is free. Yes, Edward, if your time has no value, Linux is free. Everything comes at a cost. Linux's cost is your time. But that's for you to make that trade. I'm not one to determine how much your time is worth. As a business owner, I'm trying to help as many customers as possible. None of those customers are running anything free. They're not paying me to, to fix anything free for them. But again, if your time is worth nothing, there's a lot of things that are free. All depends on how you look at the world. Anybody else have any examples of things that are free that don't have a cost? Or is it we're just ignoring the value of our time? I'm puzzled by that because time is money. In my world, the more customers I help, the more grateful customers are that they save money, got their problem fixed sooner rather than later, and paid less for it than other people charge. And the more people I can help, the more money I can make, and the more I can help the society that I live in. So I figure what I do is a customer service because I don't gouge people. I don't charge people for things they don't need. I don't try and sell them things that are overkill. You know, if they just need something basic, I sell them something basic. And if they have any problem with it, they call me and I stand behind everything I sell. So there's no more added fees or costs. But that's maybe why I'm not rich. But I like to think of doing the right thing and that people appreciate and recognize that a lot of businesses don't run that way. Yin Yang says, Costco free samples. You cannot go to Costco and get free samples unless you pay for a membership. And last I checked, that membership starts around $70. And then if you have a business executive membership, I think it's $129. Those are not free samples. You cannot just walk into Costco without a membership and go have some free samples. It doesn't work that way. You've paid for those. That's part of your membership cost. See what I'm saying? Like there's a real psychological manipulation occurring from the marketing companies that's impacting people on a mass scale where they can't see past the front door. All they see is what's in front of them without any concept of what the actual expense and consequences are. And it's frustrating me because it's so obvious and simple. It doesn't require a whole lot of thought to realize there's a flaw in the logic that free comes at cost. There's no such thing as free without a cost. Now, whether or not you think that's a deal, well, we may have different values. However, um, I am not aware of anything that's free that does not have a cost. It's in there. The only difference is whether or not you're aware of it. At least when I transact, when I make a transaction with a customer, the customer understands what they're paying for before the transaction occurs. It's all explained. Here's what you're getting. Here's how much time it'll take. Here's what the end result will be. Here's what the cost will be. Do we agree? They say yes. I do my part. I get paid. Everybody's happy. There are no surprises. If you like surprises, free is for you. All right. So anyway, <clears throat> Peter in, uh, where's Peter? He's in uh, 
Europe somewhere, right? With a one euro contribution. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for supporting the channel. Let's take a look at the phone. I have not been paying attention to it. Or do we have any, any other uh, questions I can address? I'm happy to do my best to provide answers that I hope are very logical and easy to understand to simplify things that may appear to be complex. I try to turn, I try to take things that are complex and simplify them. That's my goal. Netfreak contributes $5 via an Amazon gift card. Right on. Thank you, Netfreak. Our friend Planet Cryo says he's mailed me something, but he won't tell me what it is. So he says, be on the lookout for a package in the mail. And I said, okay. UFO man says, can you lend me $1,000, Carrie? If I had $1,000 to lend, I'd be happy to help a friend. But if you're assuming I have $1,000 that I can lend out, well, I could assume the same back to you. <laughs> Where am I going to get that from? You know what I'm saying? All right. Ron Barter says, free advice, even if you don't want it. Well, that's for sure. You know the value of free advice, right? FM Lazar says, Costco has discounted its membership to $25. So it's free then. $25 means free? I'm confused at what that statement is. Did you get hung up on the numbers as though I was some representative of Costco that's on top of their, whatever their going rate is? Those numbers were used as examples in order to emphasize that that's not free. If you got hung up on the exact numbers, I think you missed the whole point of everything I said because your focus wasn't supposed to be on the numbers. Your focus was supposed to be on that's not free. And so correcting me on the numbers doesn't change the fact and the point of what I stated. You're just trying to grab onto something in a reach that has nothing to do and it makes no point because I'm not here to sell Costco memberships. I don't know what they cost, but I know they're not free. <laughs> and if you didn't get that from the conversation, I'm concerned at what you've picked up so far of what I've said. There, it gets frustrating for me to speak and then have somebody not listen or just only hear what they want to hear. And then it makes me wonder why I bother because it's, it's frustrating, right? Because I'm passionate about what I do and I want to help people. And some people are only fixated on things that they can grab onto and latch onto to prove me wrong, which have nothing at all to do with the subject matter. And it's like, are we having the same conversation? It's a little bit frustrating sometimes. If that's all you've got to say, why did you bother saying anything at all? It was not helpful and it didn't seem to really understand what the point of the conversation was. But you know, it's the internet. What am I going to do? But I do my best to acknowledge everybody, even if I think it's ridiculous. I do my best not to alienate people and to include everybody. This is a consequence of that. What kind of tablet am I using to read the chat? So this tablet, whoops, I just closed the chat because I tapped on it. Um, this tablet is a Samsung Galaxy, uh, what do they call it, an A9? I can't remember what the name of this tablet is. Mara might be able to tell us, she might remember. It's the biggest tablet Samsung makes. In fact, I think it's the biggest tablet ever made. Um, or it used to be. They might be bigger now. This is a year old, so, you know, a lot changes. I think it's a 15-inch tablet, which is the size of what computer monitors used to be. So was that an A8 or an A9 Plus or something? S9 Ultra? 
Yeah, maybe something like that. I don't remember. I only bought it once, so <laughs> I don't sell them. It's uh it's a 15 inch tablet. It's large. I think it's 15. I, I need it large so I can read the text, right? And even still, I'll pull my glasses out. But I can also monitor the YouTube feed to make sure that the Internet's not gone down. So I can see myself a few seconds delayed, and then I can see the chat. And otherwise, I'd need to have a monitor on the desk with a computer powering it. So this has solved that problem for me. It's, and then having this arm that holds it is just ingenious. It's really a great solution for a very unique problem that I'm the only one I know that has. <laughs> but I'm very happy with it. Kyle says, I sent you my question on Facebook. I'm not logging into Facebook, but if you want to copy and paste it into the chat, you're welcome to. Galaxy Tab S9 Ultra. Nick says that's a seriously nice tab. I like it. I mean, I'm not a tablet guy. I don't use tablets. But this has been a lifesaver for me. Like, this has made communicating with you guys and seeing what's going on and monitoring so much easier uh, than the big screen that's, you know, 20 feet away from me. Um, the tablet I had here was a traditional tablet. It was just a little too small to read. When you increase the size of the fonts, it makes all the words kind of, the, the sentences shorter. The things start scrolling vertically rather than horizontally, which is, uh, to me, like a four-year-old book. Like, a, you know, if you've seen books for preschoolers and they write them in a giant font and there's like one sentence per page, that's what it felt like. So I needed something larger. And so when I saw that, I was all over it. I was like, yeah, that's a, I'm going to try that. My only concern was whether or not this would expand to hold it. And yeah, it expands and holds it just fine, as you can see. Got lucky there because I didn't, this wasn't purchased, this arm was purchased to hold a regular tablet, which it was guaranteed to do. This is an ultra large tablet, which I wasn't sure. Is it going to hold it? And uh, yeah, it all worked out. Yeah, I think Galaxy Tab S9 Ultra sounds right. <clears throat> now... If you're new to the channel, please know that I've been using Acronis for, you know, we're going on two decades here. And uh, I use it in my business. It's critical that I'm able to help my customers reliably and quickly and at a very affordable price. And when it comes to doing drive replacements or recovering customers' data, Acronis is something that is a critical tool as much as a screwdriver. It is a tool. And so I reached out to Acronis. They didn't reach out to me. I reached out to them. And I said, I use your product all the time. Is there any way we could work together? Because I don't consider myself a salesman. I'm not here to twist your arm and sell you anything. But I want my audience to know what tools a professional uses. And I want to be able to offer them a discount. It's not enough for me to just say, you could go buy this tool. I want to be able to offer my viewers a discount so they can get the same tools a professional tech uses. And if there's a way I could earn a little money or commission from that, then everybody wins. You guys get sales, the viewers get a discount, and I'm getting paid to use a tool I'm going to use that I've gladly paid for. And that's how all of this came about, in case you're curious. I get approached by companies all the time that want me to promote their nonsense. And I tell them almost universally no. On occasion, a company will come through that's curious. And usually it's not a money transaction, but rather send me the product and I'll review it. Very rarely does that ever lead to any sponsorship because either the product is not something I can stand behind as strongly as with such conviction as I do with Acronis or 
RoboForm or even VIP CDK deals. We have just a handful of companies that are qualified for me to put my name behind and put my reputation behind. So if I'm here telling you about it, I use it in my real business and it helps to keep me in business. And that company is offering you a discount in return. So you don't have to pay full price for it the way I did. And um, it just works out for everybody. And at the end of the day, it's up to you to decide if you agree with me. And that's why the other requirement is they all have free trials. Everybody's got a free trial. And it's all guaranteed. So there's no product that I will tell you about here with my name on it that we put links in the video notes that isn't 100% backed up by me. There is no risk on your part. The only thing you have to do is evaluate it yourself. So just be aware of that. I know I'm not aware of any other YouTube channel that has such strict requirements, but I also am not aware of many YouTube channels that even have working computer technicians making videos. Most tech videos are hobbyists and enthusiasts that just enjoy doing it for fun, who have no, they're not held to any accountability standards. So the pressure that's on me financially in order to earn a living, in order to keep my customers happy, is very different from just doing whatever I feel like. Which is, you know, nothing wrong with it. It's just, it's a different motivation behind the videos and how critical if I promote something because I work in the industry, it's a representation of me as an industry professional, not as somebody who just kind of does it for fun and, you know, has no consequences. So just bear that in mind. There's no risk. Everything is free trials if we're promoting it here. Everything is discounted if we're promoting it just for you guys. And it passes my requirements, which is why there's so few to pick from. Kyle says, I've got a 12 terabyte Western Digital Drives. I'm looking into 300 daily recovery, but can they really recover them? Well, nobody should ever need data recovery. Um, that's what backups are for, so that you can do your own. If you have to send your drive out for data recovery, you're paying them to make a backup for you, and it's very expensive. But the great thing about $300 data recovery is they're very transparent in their pricing. And if you go to $300, it's 300ddr.com, $300 data recovery, 300ddr.com. And they have a form for you to fill out. It basically asks you a series of questions. And based on the answers to those questions, they give you an estimate of how much it'll cost and how long it'll take and the percentage of likelihood that they will be able to succeed. It'll take you less than three minutes to answer all the questions to get your answer to your question that you should be asking them and not me. I don't run $300 data recovery. I don't know what they can and cannot do. That's why they have the web form. So for the amount of effort that you put into writing that question, you could have already had your answer by going to 300ddr.com. If I show you here, we can, we can, I can demonstrate just how simple this is. And you, there's no reason for you to have to ask that question because they provide all of that information to you. If you looked, you'd see it was there. So that's all I'm saying. Like, I'm, I'm trying to help you. I don't wanna waste your time or, or give you information of assumption. I wanna point you to facts. And the best way you're gonna get the facts is to go directly to their site. Now, if I share the screen with you here, I can show you, for example, um, when we go to $300 data recovery, it says you can drop in or mail in your device and if you click on that, it mentions uh, what to learn more about before getting started. So they explain to you how they work and what they do, right? And then you can say, okay, click below, it says, to submit our chances form. And you'll hear back from a data recovery technician in minutes. So if we click this, what is the likelihood your data will be recovered? There are a series of questions they ask us. It's all very simple. It's very straightforward. And they are very, very transparent. And they do exactly what they say they're going to do. And they give you every possible answer that, you know, what, what's the likelihood? What are the chances? And what are the, what's going to happen if I mail it in and you're not successful? What's, what happens then? Like, 
all of that's answered here. Uh, $300, data, uh, $300 data recovery is an incredible value for data recovery. It's normally upwards of two, three thousand dollars. Now, three hundred dollars is not going to cover a twelve terabyte drive. That's just way too big. But they explain that in that full disclosure page. It says once a drive exceeds two terabytes, it's like an additional hundred dollars for each additional terabyte or something, right? So if you had a RAID with five 20 terabyte drives in it and that whole RAID collapsed and you needed that data back, it's going to be quite costly. However, the fact that it's even possible, the fact you didn't make a backup, and the fact that literally any other data recovery will be no less than three times more expensive and likely take three times longer to do it and likely won't even be as successful in the process as they will, will get you to understand what a value that truly is. $300 data recovery has been around a long time. And Brian Cometa, the owner of that company, is very good at what he does. And he's very transparent. He's very honest and he's happy to, you know, uh, share the secrets of the trade. I would hope you never have to use his business. It sounds terrible. I like the guy. He's a super great guy. But if you watched my interview with him, I specifically asked him, should you have a business? If everybody backed up their computers like they should, would $300 data recovery exist? And he said, no, I'd be out of work. Followed by, I have to go now, I'm really busy. This, it, he admits he should not have a business. No one should ever need data recovery services. When you make a backup, you can be your own data recovery. It'll cost you pennies and it'll happen in an instant. Wouldn't you rather pay $35 for data recovery and have it back right now than go through what you're going through? Because when you make a backup with the Cronus, when you do your restore, that is data recovery. And it's already paid for, and it's faster, and the success rate of your data recovery is 100%. Not, I wonder if it's gonna be successful. Not, how much more is it gonna be if the drive is larger? It's one fixed price with 100% guaranteed success for $35 a year? Are you kidding me? So if you've got to use data recovery services, I cannot think of a better place than $300 data recovery. But again, people don't back up their data because they don't think it's going to happen to them. And then it happens to them, they didn't expect it, and they're unprepared. And then it's like, What's it going to cost? How long is it going to take? Is it even going to be successful? You can wipe all of that out and know exactly what it's going to cost and know exactly how long it's going to take and know it's always going to be 100% successful if you take the time to back it up now. And using a Cronus as an example, it doesn't have to be a Cronus, but because that's the product I use, that's the one I'm going to recommend. On sale for 35 bucks. It's no comparison. Be your own data recovery faster, it's cheaper, and it's 100% going to work every time. I appreciate the question, but a 12 terabyte drive is, is well beyond the $300 starting point, so it's going to cost some money. Can they recover it? Likely they can. In most cases, I would say 90% of the drives that are sent to them, they are able to successfully recover, even when other data recovery companies said they couldn't do it. $300 data recovery, it was faster and cheaper, is also has a much higher success rate. However, not every drive can be recovered because if the platters have shattered or been scratched, nobody can recover that. It's done. But they can do a lot from using donor drives and head swaps to firmware changes. They have specialized hardware where they can read drives that can't be read otherwise. And like I said, a 90% success rate and they just don't know until they get the drive, right? What's going on? But at the very least, they won't cause any harm to the drive, meaning if there's something wrong with the drive that they can't recover it, they'll send it back to you without any damage, without any further damage, so that you have the option to send it to a more expensive data recovery place should you choose to. They're not going to break it while trying to fix it. They won't make it worse. They're either gonna fix it 
or they're going to send it back to you in the same condition so that you can pursue alternative sources at potential repair. That's important to know because a lot of the data recovery information online about using programs like Spinrite or putting the drive in a freezer are causing permanent damage that every time you do that, if it doesn't immediately ruin your chances, every time you do it, your chances of success fall lower and lower and lower. It's just one of those, if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, you might as well throw it into the recycle bin because you will break it trying to get your data back that way if it's not successful. And the more you pursue it and the more you keep damaging the drive, if it was hard to recover before, you will make it impossible for anybody to recover it at any price if these do-it-yourself projects don't work. If you're willing to take that risk, you know, go for it. I've seen drives, I've seen people that had drives that nobody can make heads or tails of what's going on with the drive. The customers think they know what's going on. Customers are like, well, the head actuator is not, the customer doesn't know what they're talking about. And I've seen $300 data recovery, literally on camera, plug this drive in with specialty hardware they have, and they read all the data just fine, like it's nothing. Like it, because of the specialty hardware they have that you and I don't have, because it's like $150,000, they can pull the drive data like that in most drives where the drive won't work in a Windows or a traditional motherboard. And it literally takes no effort if you have the knowledge and you know how to use the software. I saw him do it in front of my own eyes. It blew my mind. So just having those tools and the education on how to use those tools took something that was impossible for a layman to recover and turn it into a very minimal effort. And that's why when you look at the review of the place, He's got multiple recoveries going on. 30, 40, 50 recoveries are all happening simultaneously because of the amount of time it takes to pull the data off the drive. But getting the data off the drive is usually the easy part. It's the time, right? If it's, especially if it's a large drive, you gotta pull all that data off and then you gotta put it onto another drive. So let's say you have a 12 terabyte, just to put a nail in this, let's say you've got a 12 terabyte drive that fails. If he's able to recover it, and let's say this thing's got 10 or 12 terabytes of drive of data on it, where does the data go? You will have to provide him with the drive to put the data on. He's not going to upload 12 terabytes to the cloud. Are you kidding? So he'll say, look, you can either send me a drive. Here's the good news. I can get your data back, but I need somewhere to put it. I can sell you a drive to put it on and put it in the mail and there's no waiting. I can do it today. Or you can mail me a drive and assuming it gets here in working condition, we're happy to put the data on your own provided drive and mail it back to you. Of course, you'll be waiting on the mail. Which do you want to do? And he doesn't overcharge for the drive. You know, he might make 20 bucks on the drive, maybe. There's, I mean, he's not a charity, but he's also not gouging. It's not like the price of umbrellas goes up because it's raining. He's just not that kind of guy. But do bear in mind, the cost of the recovery is one step. Where do you put the data once it's recovered? That's another step or another expense that needs to be considered. Where's that data gonna go? That drive is never gonna be repaired. You cannot repair it. All you can do is pull the data off of it. If you're lucky and you're skilled and you have the knowledge and you have the tools, in most cases you can successfully pull the data off. Now, if it's only got two terabytes of data on it, then you don't need a 12 terabyte drive. You just need a drive big enough to hold the amount of data that's being recovered. But worst case scenario, a 12 terabyte drive with 12 terabytes on it will require a 12 terabyte drive to move the data to. None of that's given away for free. The more data you have, the more it costs, the longer it takes. Does that make sense? I think it's very reasonable. Or you can just back it all up yourself for 35 bucks buying a Cronus and never find yourself in this position. I mean, a little late for this person, but it may not be late for the rest of you. So I do appreciate the question. And I hope that the answer uh, is helpful for you. At least gives you a better idea of what sort of time and money is involved. And don't be afraid to reach out to $300 data recovery. They're very responsive. They're very communicative with their customers at all times throughout the entire process. 
There are no surprises with them. And they're very open, very transparent. You wouldn't want to work with anybody else. Like they are in a class of their own in price, quality, and doing exactly what they say they're going to do for the amount they say it's going to cost. They nail it every time. Just read the reviews for $300 data recovery on Yelp. I hope you have time because they're the highest rated re uh, data recovery company on Yelp anywhere in the world. Nobody's rated higher in data recovery. So read from other people's experiences and decide for yourself. Taffer said he just securely wiped a two terabyte drive with a three pass wipe. It took one day and 21 hours. Yeah. Sure. So Kyle says, I've got four terabytes of data. And having a 12 terabyte drive is the reason I was extending my drive to back data onto it. And then no need to spend more money for less because I started with a one terabyte. Well, you can't, <clears throat> you can't use the same drive you're backing up as the backup drive because then if the drive fails, you've lost both the original and the copy. So there is no backup if there's only one drive. That's not a backup. That's just adding more data to the same drive. I had a, I had a business customer once who had an external backup drive and they were synchronizing the files off of their NAS onto the backup drive. The problem was they weren't doing any maintenance and they weren't paying me to do any maintenance. They only called me reactively rather than proactively. They waited till they had a problem. And when they had a problem, boy, did they have a problem. So <clears throat> what ended up happening is the employee said, well, the backup drive is full, so I'll just back up the NAS to the NAS. And the NAS is a lot of data, hundreds of thousands of files. And the employee was very, very uh, faithful to doing these backups, like religiously faithful to doing these backups. If it wasn't daily, certainly weekly. And each time they backed up to the network attached storage device from the network attached storage device, they clogged up all the network traffic, slowing the network down for the entire building. Eventually, they ran out of space on the NAS because they weren't overwriting the old backups. They just kept creating new ones. So the data had to get, you get copied over and over and over to the point where the data was so backed up, it was like LA traffic you know, you're on a freeway and it ain't moving. It's, it's going so slow, you might as well get out and walk. The NAS was overwhelmed. The switches, everything on the network was overwhelmed. Everybody in the office was complaining about how slow it was. And then they started getting warnings that the NAS was running out of space. Well, the NAS is like a 60 terabyte NAS, of which they use about 1.5 terabytes. Once I realized what was going on and why it happened, I had to delete all those backups. 56 terabytes of backups took three days to erase over the network. I said, this isn't going to happen quickly. It has to manually erase over several million files. And the way that the erase occurs is it, you know, it's saying, you know, this file in this directory, it has to do that for every single file in every single folder for every single bit of data that was used as the backup. But you have to understand a backup is a copy. In other words, if I have a backup of something, that means I have a copy of it. So if something happens to the original, I have the copy. If something happens to the copy, I still have the original. Therefore, putting the same data on the same drive is not a backup or moving the data from the drive to the backup drive is not a backup either because now you no longer have the original now you only have the copy so you want to have duplicates of anything important placed on different drives so that you will never find yourself in the position this person finds themselves in larger drives cost more and result in bigger failures so in other words 
If you drive an 18-wheel truck, you have 18 tires you have to maintain that can go flat. You have a higher chance of having a flat tire when you have 18 tires than if you're driving a car with four tires. You only have four tires that can go flat. If you drive a motorcycle, you only have two tires that can go flat. If you need to replace your tires, you only have to buy two. So if you're going to buy larger drives, not only are they going to cost more, but the importance of backing them up becomes even more critical because you have so much more to lose. And that's the problem with these big drives. You can buy a 24 terabyte drive on Amazon right now. And if that drive fails, you will lose up to 24 terabytes of data if you did not back it up. And if that drive was full, the only thing you can back it up to reasonably is another 24 terabyte drive. So I hope you plan on buying them in pairs. So yeah, these stories, these are real stories. I don't make this stuff up. This is stuff that really happened. And just deleting the data took three days. And once it was done, the NAS went from 99.9% .9 full capacity to like 0.7% capacity, which is where it sits today. I now have a maintenance client, uh, a maintenance contract with that customer now. They realize, you know, we, we probably should have been ahead of this. And I'm like, I, I would have stopped this a long, long time ago. It wouldn't have gone this far. And thankfully, apart from the, the, the whole office slowed down and everybody was getting impatient and upset with it, there was no real damage other than to somebody's pride. I'm sure they were. The person doing it was quite embarrassed. They didn't realize what they were doing. They thought they were doing the right thing and there was nobody supervising them and they didn't ask for any help. And so nobody in the business knew what was going on. That all changes when I get involved. I know exactly what's going on. I check it regularly and we stop these things. If we see some unusual activity, we don't wait until it causes a problem. We stop it and address it right then and there. All right, let's see what else we have in the chat. I just want to, you know, I really like interacting with you guys, and especially if there's a lack of clarity or understanding or if I'm not communicating well. It gives me an opportunity to improve my communication if I'm not being understood. I see that as a, as a fault of the communicator and something for me to try again, you know, to pick another example, pick another analogy. Sometimes these are very complex topics, and my specialty, I consider, to be able to take complex subject matter and turn it into plain English and using analogies that everybody can easily understand. Sometimes people want a certain answer. And if they don't get the answer they want, they get upset. But you have to understand that I'm not here to give you the answers you want. I'm here to give you the answers you've asked for. Whether or not you like those answers is not important. Whether or not you understood the answer is very important. Um, sometimes the diagnosis is a bad one, but it's important that you know it so you know how to move forward. I don't think it would be responsible for a doctor to tell you you don't have cancer because you don't want to hear it. So I'm sorry if the information I convey is information you don't want to hear, but unfortunately that is, that is the honest and truthful, most candid answer I can provide. On the other hand, if the answer is not clear to you, if I've left something murky or there's a misunderstanding, then please let me know so I have an opportunity to rephrase it or find another example. Because I'm, I'm here to help. Even if that help is going to be a little hurtful, it's to reduce the pain later on, 
right? It's like you take your medicine and you swallow it down and, you know, it's uncomfortable and maybe it doesn't taste good, but it leads you on the right path to getting better. Thirty six bounces. Carrie, this is a wonderful topic. So thank you. Right on. Well, thank you. Thirty six bounces. I appreciate it. The expedition wants to know, what do you recommend to back up drives onto a NAS? Another NAS, preferably. If you have a NAS, presumably you've got a lot of data. Um, the customer that I refer to has a 40 terabyte NAS or 60 terabyte. It's massive, but they're only using less than two terabytes. I think they're using maybe even less than a terabyte. That might be around 900 gigs. I can't remember. Could be 1500 gigs. Regardless, you know, these little two terabyte drives to just file synchronize is all he needs. But they keep adding data every day, as every business does, and most people do. Most people aren't taking any data away. They're, we have more data this year than we've had in the entirety of the human race from the very beginning of time. And we will have more data next year than we've ever had in the entirety of the human race since the beginning of time. And we will have more data the year after that. As this is very easily predictable when the latest phones have larger megapixel cameras, the images are bigger, the storage requirements are larger, and it makes it so easy to take pictures. We're taking more pictures now than we ever took in decades. In one year, there's more pictures being taken that were made in all other, you know, you go to the 1960s and before. We've already taken more pictures digitally with our cameras and digital devices than any film ever took. So all that data needs to go somewhere. And very rarely are we deleting any of it. We're just constantly adding more to it. So at some point, um, whether it's because the customer gets busier or they change their business model or they change the software they're using, they have room to grow. But for right now, for their backup solution, they don't need much. You know, a few of these two terabyte drives, even two terabyte SSDs are relatively inexpensive. And we rotate them out. Again, we have anywhere from three to six of them. It's up to the customer to decide how much of an investment they want to make. And if their data set's small enough, we could certainly update it and upload it to a cloud service, which, you know, under two terabytes, it's very affordable for things like Google Drive or Microsoft OneDrive. If you can get past the customer's concern of security in that, which a lot of my customers just don't trust the internet as a storage place for their critical business data, which contains private client information. So we much prefer, my clients overall, much prefer to have that data in their hand, right? They, they wanna have this in their hands. If it's up in the cloud and the customer says, show me my data, show me where it's going, I cannot show them. Well, it's going to Google, right? Yeah, okay, take me to Google, take me to the data center and show me the server that my data is on. So I have some peace of mind of where it is. No, I can't do that. Okay, so for many of my customers, that's not acceptable. The lawyers, the dentists, the accountants, no, 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 no. So they say, okay, how do we maintain control of our data? I say, well, we can do it a couple different ways. If you have a NAS, we can buy a duplicate NAS and put it at the business owner's home and have the NAS update itself. And the business owner says, well, how do I know if that's working? I go, well, you still have to pay me. I mean, I, I need to audit it. Yeah, but what if it breaks? Does that mean you have to come out to my house? Maybe. And if my internet goes down, yeah, it's not going to work. I say, okay, well, that's, that's not good enough. Like, this is my business. I get it. I say, what I can do for you is I can make your backups for you. I can come out. I can bring your backup drives that you pay for, and I label them. You'll see this one says right on it, I've got a sticker. It says backup number two. This is a client's real backup drive. Obviously, I'm not going to plug it in and show you what's on it. Why do I have it if it belongs to my customer? The customer is paying me to secure this off-site where if anything happens to the building, if an employee gets pissed off and deletes everything on their way out the door, if the building catches fire, I have this here. So the customer says, how often will you take that home? I go, how much money do you want to pay? 
I'll drive over there and take it home every night if you want to pay me for that. Well, how much is that? That's a lot of money. Well, how much is it if we did it once a week? This much money. How much is it if we did it every two weeks? This much money. Then I asked the customer, how much money would it cost you to pay your employees to recreate two weeks worth of lost data? So we settled on once a month. Come over there once a month, take backup drive two, unplug it, plug it in to the computer that has backup drive one, take backup drive one. So now they've got an on-site backup and they have an off-site backup. The on-site backup happens once a week, every Friday night, and the off-site backup happens once a month. And based on that, they're paying a tiny amount of money for service. They've already had data loss, but because of the backups, they lost nothing at all. Therefore, they have already avoided catastrophe three times, and I don't even think the business owner is aware of it. When the employee calls me and says, I was, I'm here on the weekend, I'm doing overtime, and I just accidentally deleted my file. I'm such an idiot, I can't believe I did it. Is there anything you can do to help me get it back? I log in remotely, I go to the NAS's recycle bin and there's the customer's file, but the recycle bin is limited to administrator access only because it's a network attached storage device and can contain critical data that not employees, not all employees should, should have access to. And I just recovered that file. And I said, I mean, this whole conversation took two or three minutes. I said, open that file up, that should be your file. And she said, yeah, but in, how much of it's missing? I said, you tell me. And she said, oh my Lord. I go, what? Like, I don't know, is that a good thing or bad? She goes, this is exactly where I left off. Exactly, you have no idea. You just saved my life. Okay, <laughs> anything else I can do to help you? Oh, I just, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're very welcome. Let me know if you have any other problems. Have a nice day. That was possible because the recycle bin's turned on. Some people have a NAS, they don't turn on the recycle bin. I've had customers that turn on the recycle bin and never empty it, and the NAS gets full. And they say, I don't understand what's happening. I say, well, you haven't called me in four years. Yeah, we haven't had any problems. But you're having a problem now? Oh man, we're having all kinds of problems. Come to find out, nobody ever emptied the recycle bin in the last four years. So. They bought a new NAS thinking that, so rather than call me, they decided to solve this on their own and they decided to buy a new NAS. But they couldn't get the data transferred off the old NAS because it wasn't functional anymore because it wasn't operational due to the fact that it was overloaded with data. So they hired another tech. They didn't want to hire me. They, we, we don't always see eye to eye. So they hired another tech and that tech put everything out into the cloud. And they said, this is costing a thousand dollars a month where it was costing us nothing before. And it's taking forever when I click on a file to get the file, when I save a file, the whole office is crazy. We're at our wits end. Would you come back to us? And I said, yeah, I need to see what's going on. The NASs were covered in cobwebs and dust. They had just put them on a shelf and waited until they had a problem. And then they would just hire whoever was available to fix it, which only made things worse. Once they've exhausted all this time and all this money, I imagine it wasn't an easy phone call for them to make because I know they did not want to call me. And then they called me and I had it fixed in two days. And they said, you're unbelievable. And I said, no, nah, it's really no big deal. They're like, no, you don't understand. Like you're, we couldn't find anybody to fix this. You have no idea how much we appreciate you. This is the exact opposite of what they said to me four years earlier. I said, it was my pleasure. And honestly, what I, didn't, what I did wasn't, wasn't that big of a deal. It was a pretty easy problem to solve. It was time consuming, but once you saw what was wrong with it, it really wasn't that big of a deal. Thank you for calling me and I'm glad I was able to help you. And now I haven't heard from them again. So you can imagine they're gonna wait until something gets all screwed up again. I hate that. It's a lot of work. You know, there's a lot of investigative discovery that's got to go on to figure out what's going on. How did this happen? How do we fix it? And how do we move forward from here?
And the bottom line is there was nothing wrong with their NAS. Once the recycle bin was emptied, that NAS was, even it was six or seven years old, was fully functional. There was nothing wrong with it. It did not need to be replaced. Then the problem was they had data in the cloud that wasn't on the NAS and that all had to be synchronized. And we're talking over a million files. Once again, there's software that can make that process automated, but it takes forever and nobody can make any changes while it's happening. So I don't know where that stands anymore. I just, I said, you know, think of the cloud as your backup at this point. But as far as I know, they're still paying $1,000 a month for that much storage in the cloud to Microsoft, which is more than they ever paid me. Just saying. All right, we're just over two hours here. So uh, the expedition wants to know what file synchronization software is used overall. It's really up to you. I mean, there's countless software packages out there from, uh, you know, our friends at RoboForm, they have a product called GoodSync that has a free trial. There's a product called Syncron Syn Sync Syncovery. Um, there's got to be a thousand different file synchronization programs out there. Do any of you have any that you use and recommend? I still think the, the best way to back up a NAS is to another NAS. And then if you get the same make and model, or at least the same make, like Synology to Synology, it's pretty painless and it's pretty reliable. Assuming you have the internet bandwidth on both sides to support that. Kyle says, thanks for the info. You're welcome, Kyle. Thank you for asking your question. I appreciate it. These are real world examples instead of what ifs and hypotheticals. I much prefer to deal with reality, with real people, with real issues that have real concerns. Too many enthusiasts and um, hobbyists will create channels creating hyperbole and exaggeration and examples that aren't realistic in the real world. Being a real working computer technician, I deal with real world problems. And when I talk about them, I can be very serious about it because nobody's happy having to call me. They're happy when I've completed the job and everything works, but they don't want, you know, and who would blame them, right? I don't want to have to go get surgery, but if I need it, I'll be glad to have it done. So when I do my videos, I'm coming from a perspective of essentially my livelihood, my ability to not have to go find another career versus I just do these videos for fun because it's something I do just for fun. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I just wouldn't be able to pay my bills and then I'd be homeless. But some hobbyists have done very well for themselves here on YouTube, making YouTube their career. But they're talking about things where they're not held accountable. And they're talking about situations which are very impractical. And I watch it, and I, not always, but there are times where I watch these channels and I'm like, what is this guy talking about? Like, who in their right mind would do that? And then I realize he's never done this for anybody in his life. He's just doing this for himself. It wouldn't make any sense to do this for other people at a price that you would be held accountable to. So I think, you know, I need to make videos that represent reality in the real world versus these hypothetical situations where people are essentially privileged that they have the time and the money to play in the film themselves playing. I would love to be in that position. Wouldn't that be great? I didn't have to rely on satisfying customers and putting myself in a potentially litigious situation where I failed to meet the customer's needs, which resulted in a financial loss for which they're going to pursue legal action against me. I would much rather make the videos purely for fun and be able to make that my 100% entirely my income with absolutely no potential for litigation. <laughs> no responsibility, just play. Um, 
yeah, I, would, I think I would enjoy that very much. But I figure this is more important, right? I think what I do to help people, to, to help people to be self-reliant, to make sure that you guys get discounts on products that I approve of, um, I feel like what I do matters more than just playing. But, you know, maybe I'm biased. Pretty bad when I can't, when I need my glasses to find my glasses. All right. Uh, yeah, like anything else, you know, when it comes to any type of software, backup software, file recovery software, whatever, you need to sort of evaluate it based on your expectations, your needs. So anybody who has advice for that, if there's a file synchronization program you use, um, that's the best we can do is introduce you to it. And at the end of the day, you know, I don't know anything about it. I don't have an opinion. Um, you'll just have to evaluate it and see if it meets your needs. Hey, there's Frankie B saying hello. Welcome in, Frankie. And thank you again for your generous Amazon gift card earlier today. Lynn's Music says I have a backup for my glasses. Oh, so do I. I've got a set of glasses in every room in this place and in the car. But that doesn't necessarily mean I can find them. <sighs> That's the truth. All right. Sometimes I need my glasses to find my glasses is all I'm saying. <coughs> Rope in the chat room says, Acronis has already saved me once. It was well worth it. Also, are you still fine with Synology for NAS or QNAP, which seems to be upping their game? Um, I think it's a personal preference. I think it's like asking me if I preferred Ford over Chevy or Nissan over Toyota. At the end of the day, I think it really just sort of depends on what you're expecting, what your budget is, which interface you prefer. You know, TerraMaster... They've come quite a, uh, along quite a ways, and they're worthy of consideration. As um, Ugreen is coming out with their NAS, but it's a first-generation product, so I wouldn't jump on it for a year until I work out the issues. But I feel like I'm forgetting somebody. TerraMaster, QNAP, Synology. There's one more. Asus Store. So Asus Store is a branch of Asus, but it's not Asus. ASUS Store is its own individual operation that's branched off of ASUS. And the ASUS Store, the, uh, the Flash Store 6 or the Flash Store 12, uh, worthy of consideration. Uh, the interface is very similar in many ways to QNAP and Synology and TerraMaster. They obviously make differences between them. <clears throat> Synology has something called a B station, which we were going to talk about today, but I decided I, I really need to make a video just on the B station. If you're interested, the B station is essentially a portable drive with NAS software on it that's designed for non technical people to just plug and play and follow the on screen steps to create backups and to utilize different types of commonly wanted apps that are traditionally configured by the nerds if you want to say that the technical nerds synology has simplified it so that anybody with any experience regardless if you know how to turn the computer on and that's all much you know the b station is made for you so if you're interested in learning about it before we get to it please know there are already youtube videos out there talking about the b station and the B drive, and they are designed for non-technical people. And uh, if you are a technical person, you're not gonna like it because it takes away all your control and it simplifies everything so no mistakes can be made and that you can rely on it. So if you're in that school of thought, you might wanna look at that as an option where it doesn't require a big investment of education or time and learning. 
it's mostly a plug and play solution where you just answer the questions that are asked and it automates everything for you. It's long overdue. Not a solution for businesses, but for a home user who feels like computers are above them for whatever reason, and that's a mental issue, computers aren't above any of us, but if that's your state of mind, there are products that are simplified and they're getting better and better. And I think the B station and the B drive um, will likely appeal to the majority of home computer users more so than any other type of uh, backup because it's so easy. Thirty six bounces. Carrie, I have used CDK deals for five different occasions for Windows as well as Microsoft Office, and it's been a joy to save money. And thank you so much. That's what I'm talking about. I'm just saving you guys money. Luke Greeny wants me to check my phone. All right, Luke, I will check my phone. It's been a while and then we'll probably start wrapping things up. So if you do have any uh, final questions or concerns about your data or backup or anything of a technical nature, uh, please ask it in the chat now and I will do my best to provide a, an answer for you. Also, we have very, very smart people in our community, uh, many of whom are much smarter than me. So don't just wait for my response. Also watch the chat from response from our community. And if you're not a part of our community, I hope you'll consider sticking around. It's free. Um, we just ask you to be nice. If you can't be nice, then we don't want you here. But if you can be a nice person, we'd love to see you on a regular basis and hope you'll continue to join us in our community of other nice, like-minded individuals. Uh, let's see. What is this? Oh, email. There it is. Lou Greenia sends $25. Oh, excuse me, through PayPal. He says, thank you for your time and advice. It's greatly appreciated. Right on. Well, thank you, Luke, as always. And remember that sale on Acronis is going on right now. Show it to you one more time. If I can figure out how to bring my screen up. There it is. Draw your attention to that statement right there. So it's not like you've got to act today. You've got a couple of weeks to take advantage of the offer. If you're short on cash right now or you're getting paid soon, whatever, uh, after April 16th, that special goes away. Now we will continue to offer 30% off here all throughout 2024. So if you're unable to take advantage of this offer, just know you still don't have to pay the full manufacturer's suggested retail price because you're a viewer you have that discount code available to you throughout the rest of the year. So I don't want to pressure you. This is not, this is not a high pressure sales tactic. I don't like that. I don't like it when people do it to me, but I'm certainly not going to do it to you. I also don't like it when someone doesn't tell me about a sale and I find out about it after it ended. And then I'm angry that nobody told me. So it's a fine line between, you know, Hey, hard sell and don't say anything at all. All right, and one last look here in the chat. Again, I want to thank our friends at Acronis for everything they do for us, for their support, and for the amazing software they make that makes my life as a technician so much more profitable, so much more reliable, so much easier. Steve says the B station drive can't be replaced. Yeah, that's something I'll have to look into. I imagine there's a um, there's a version of the there's a B station and a B drive, and I think the B station you plug your own drive into it, and the B station is for people who who think plugging their own drive into it's too complicated. But if you want the ability to change the drive out, you probably want the B. I'm not sure which one's which now. I think the B station is like $99. And then you just provide your own 
USB drive to plug into it. And it essentially becomes the B station. The B station already has the drive, so you're not burdened with that decision of which drive do I buy and what size do I buy. It's all decisions made for you. Much like an Apple product, a lot of the parts then are going to be locked into that configuration. But it does have a warranty, and it does offer um, the ability to do external backups as well. But obviously, if you're somebody buying one, you're probably not going to be that advanced to do that. But again, we'll talk more about that when we get time to review it. But there are two different versions, one with the drive already in it, and one where you provide the drive, just so you know. Yes, again, happy Easter to everybody. I hope you're having a great Easter Sunday. It is a overcast and rainy day here in Phoenix, but we always like the rain. We never get enough of it. Knocks all the dust out of the air. Cleans up the air a bit. I'm just scrolling through the chat just to see if there's anything in the past I've missed. Otherwise, um, if I've missed your question, it wasn't on purpose, you can copy and paste it again so I see it. Because the chat doesn't go all the way back to the beginning. It only goes back so far. So if I've missed your question, don't take it personally. It means I just didn't see it. Planet Cryo says, I missed a couple of contributions. Did I? Let me go back and take a look at that real quick. I always like to say thank you to the folks who contribute. <clears throat> so, oh yeah, Planet Cryos contributed $5. He says, hey, Carrie and everybody, I've been busy, but I just want to stop in and say hello and show support. Adulting is taking up all of his time. Well, that's okay. Thank you for the support. Good to see you, my friend. Josiah Guernsey renews membership, now a member for <clears throat> 19 months. Jason H88 has says, Acronis is a wonderful tool. One thing I like is it just works. It does all the, as does all the hardware and software you recommend. Thank you for all your teachings and sharing your knowledge. Well, thank you. I appreciate your kind words and the support. I think I got everybody else. Larry G had sent in a $20 super chat and renewed his membership. Now a member for 22 months. Thank you so much for that, Larry G. Of course, our friend uh, Rick Lakes in Minnesota kicked us off with our first contribution earlier today of $5. Always good to see Rick. Bull142 wants me to check my email, and Mark Gaines wants me to check my PayPal. Okay. Let's check him again. Bull142 sends a $25 Amazon gift card. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. And our friend Mark Gaines with a $20 PayPal contribution. Right on. You guys rock. You know, Mark joins us. I'm not sure where Bull 142 is. Mark joins us all the way from Northern Ireland. How cool is that? And, of course, Peter in the Netherlands, our friend Buster in Scotland. Uh, we have people watching us from all over the world, which is pretty darn cool. And everything looks pretty quiet in there. So I'm going to guess. Bill 142 said he's in Georgia. 
He says, I have one of your computers. No, I remember. I remember that you picked up a computer from me. Um, and thank you for that. Hopefully it's working well for you. I'm a little concerned that my connection here is showing uh, a blank screen in my YouTube studio for some reason. I think it wants me to refresh. If only there was a technician around. That's why I uh, keep an eye on the tablet here because I, the YouTube studio is, is hokey. It's, it's uh, I don't know what they're thinking. Uh, the people at YouTube just, they're more focused on delivering videos to viewers than they are in making, helping creators make videos. And so the YouTube studio is, it's very unreliable and it's very finicky. So there, now it's working again after a refresh. Good quality stuff from YouTube there, where all the time and attention is to the viewer, not for the creator. Even if the creators didn't make content, they wouldn't have any viewers, but I don't know what to do with that. Uh, maybe I need to go get a job at YouTube. That would last about 27 seconds. <laughs> that's what I think. Uh, all right, that's going to wrap it up for us. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. and. Uh, I hope you found the information uh, inspiring uh, and a motivator. If for any reason you've been procrastinating or haven't done your backup yet, remember, nobody cares more about your data than you do. So if you can't be bothered, it really doesn't affect anybody else but you. Keep in mind, Acronis has that sale going on. I strongly recommend you take advantage of it. It's a heck of a deal. Like I said, cost Mitch and I more to eat lunch at Arby's than for a year's worth of a Cronus. Now, if I could have got a year's worth of Arby's for $35, I'd probably be in the hospital right now. <laughs> and there goes that sponsorship for Arby's. Bye. Thanks, you guys, so much for all your contributions and support. Enjoy the rest of your Easter and what's left of your Sunday. I will be back again tomorrow for the regular Members Only Mondays where we get a behind-the-scenes look at what's going on in the channel, what I'm working on, and the status of upcoming videos for that week. So if you're a member, I hope you'll join me tomorrow. Always 1 o'clock Pacific time is when we start. That's 4 p.m. Eastern with our live interactive chat. If you're just joining us now, just know you'll be able to rewind and watch this video at your convenience from this point now until the end of time. Thanks for watching. Thank you to Marlena, of course, for all the help with the thumbnail that she did for today's video in our video notes. Everybody who has contributed, to everybody who's a member, and to everybody who participated in the chat room, thank you for your kindness. And thank you for uh, just being who you are. Again, thank you to Frankie B for his generosity, Oystein, Buster, all these guys who make this content so possible, much more possible. Um, I can't extend enough gratitude to all of you. Thank you so much. Until next time, bye for now.